I've got stuff. I use an app called Boomerang in my email that just, I don't want to look at that email now. Send it to me again in three months time, six months time, whenever. And these emails pop up three months later and I go, no, go away. Come, come back in six months and I might look at it again. And then six months later it comes up and I go, what a stupid idea that was. Let's, let's forget that. So it's that test of time. If it's a brilliant idea on holiday, you don't need to do it the minute you get back from holiday. Hey everybody, it's John Lamerton here alongside my good friend and business partner, Mr. Jason Brockman. We are here for another episode of the Ambitious Lifestyle Business Podcast, where as always, it is our job to help you get more customers and make more money without just working harder. So without further ado, let's dive straight into this month's episode. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Ambitious Lifestyle Business Podcast. We are joined today by Carolyn Gutler from Curious Rose. Uh, good, I was going to say good afternoon, but obviously people are listening to this podcast whenever. So good afternoon, good evening, good morning, Caroline. How are you? Hello, I'm good. Thank you. Yeah, nice weather in London again. <laughs> well, this is our October episode. Ah. Oh. And we're recording it at uh, the back end of a heat wave. <laughs> yeah, that's a bit clouded over, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so lovely weather we might be having in London we today. We might be having in London, yes, yeah, all right. <laughs> Absolutely. So bearing in mind what the uh, current weather forecast is, um, what the outlook is for people over the coming winter, um, do you want to tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Right, so... Yes, so I'm the director of Curious Rose, which is a company making hot wheat bags and hot water bottles and gloves and furry bed socks and anything to keep you warm in bed. So less popular in the August heat wave, perfect in October when the nights are drawing in and getting chilly. I think that's probably going to lead us on quite nicely to our first question, because you've got a very cyclical business. As you said, you're not going to sell a lot of hot water bottles in July and August, are you? Yeah, that is the problem. Yeah, being seasonal is uh, the biggest challenge I face for uh, sales, but mainly cash flow. Uh, although I did early days when I was learning about Facebook ads, once do a uh, Facebook ad for a hot water bottle on the hottest day of July, which was um, surprisingly not successful. <laughs> so, yeah, being seasonal business um, and mainly a gift oriented business when people buy for Christmas presents, that is the that is the biggest challenge trying to find something else to sell the other half of the year Mm. i think the where we've talked to seasonal businesses on the podcast before we've either said like you've you've, you almost need to find a uh, contradictory business Mm. so i don't know selling air conditioners (laughs) in the summer which is quiet in the in the winter or you accept that there will be lulls there will be very very quiet periods and you don't try and push treacle uphill during those times and then you actually just relax rest and recharge um and then you go hell for leather when it is busy time um the flip side of that is being able to actually work on your business uh during the quiet times because when you're busy 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 and it's the coldest day of the year you've just got to get the orders out the door yes from a management point of view that's actually Uh, one stop round the clock we're at the busiest now in the summer getting ready for September October November yeah and then probably March March April I have a quiet period um I was saying to Jason yesterday one of the goals is to use because we only use British factories and British manufacturing one of the goals is to use the uh, knitwear and sewing factories when they're off peak so they finished knitting Christmas jumpers. And they said custard jumpers, wasn't it? Um, they finished knitting. And so spring is a brilliant time to try and use that slack period in the factories because British manufacturing, again, for jumpers is cyclical. So, yeah, so that's the goal. But am I having August off? No, we're working frantically to get all our ducks in a row for September. Um, I, I, I always remember um, Zach, one of our... Um, friends sadly no longer with us runs or used to run a, a gift shop and he would always talk about um the christmas in july yeah. at xl and he said it's just such a surreal moment to be walking around xl in shorts and flip-flops 
looking at Christmas decorations and Christmas jumpers and Christmas trees everywhere. And they've got um, Noddy Holder playing in the background. It's like, it's July, it's July. And you've just got to get, but that's, that is the business. And actually, um, you know, Christmas sales aren't done in November and December. They are done in July and August. Well, the um, Christmas magazines, the big Christmas gift guides, want their photos in start of July onwards. Yeah. So literally in the recent heat wave, we have been, up ladders with cameras and uh, we've made fake snow from you know that stuff that explodes from water and um going to raid trees from the park evergreens from the park and sort of splitting them with silver and trying to make christmas happen while secretly absolutely sweating windows open fans on so it's an odd business to be in it really is odd You've been in the group for an awful long time, haven't you? Now, which which is which has been I don't know whether it's been awful, but it's been great for us to be honest because it's been nice to watch you um, so kind of flourish, on. having some challenges and uh, and then kind of overcoming yeah. those as well and being able to support you through those. Um, I think one of those one of those challenges kind of hit you in January of this year, I think, really, mm. wasn't it? And that was where where there was a kind of a realization in the business that Christmas has just been and gone, and um, we need now need to get the numbers to make it work for the for subsequent Christmases, wasn't it? Really, yeah. and I think yeah. you put a um, a really a really nice post in in our group, really, which which kind of shows that value of our community in terms of reaching out and saying, actually, I'm having a real big problem right now, and I'm mm. feeling. Good. Uh, a bit vulnerable um what what could what can i do i am mean, kind of like a, a bit of a crossroads wasn't it i think really mm, yeah very much so um i've made many mistakes along the way the first and main one was that i thought we had to make everything ourselves so we spent two or three years getting and falling out with friends and family and trying to make everything ourselves um and then we spent a lot of time getting production right but i hadn't paid attention to the marketing so you're quite right last christmas um we did fantastically the one before in lockdown, lots of people shopping online. Um, and then last Christmas, we thought that would continue without any effort. And as you say, I was so disappointed when it didn't work. Um, and just, I mean, the beauty of the group is this massive pool, not just you two, but massive pool of expertise that you can ask people about anything. I mean, like asking the group about accounts yesterday. Um, but yeah, I mean, the massive encouragement at Christmas, because I was really like, I can't do this. This has flopped. And actually, we've got so many strengths in the business. The, so the only, but the main thing was cash flow, which you've really, really helped me with. Pulling it together budget wise and keeping on track of the numbers, the accountants come and help on that. And, you know, website people come and help on that bit. And everyone's just pulling their expertise. And the group was just so supportive. It was it's been brilliant. Yeah. Um, one of the things which um you just said during that really and 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 it resonates with me because i've had i, I do one-to-ones with all of our, our members or lots of our members who want them and i think yesterday i spoke to four people who all had that same issue that you've just identified and that is they concentrate on various aspects of their business whether that's operational or whether that's the um the processes or what, what those are but forget that actually if you don't do the marketing bit, yeah, <laughs> then actually yeah. the customers kind of dry up and 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 that that that's that's the same situation you kind of find yourself in. And, and again, I had those conversations with a few few warmer centers yesterday. And and it's just uh, it's it's all about levers, isn't it? And it's about which levers you're gonna pull and which one you're gonna yeah. push it. and then actually getting that that kind of balance right. And um yeah, it, that that just as I say, just resonated with me there from from our conversations yesterday as well. So it's it's a, it's a typical thing to happen. It's like, yeah, yeah I'm going to yeah. get these systems and processes right because you've banged that out the door no, without any problems at all. You know, you're not knitting anymore. You're not doing the sewing yourself. You, you've got yeah. all of that outsourced. You've got the distribution outsourced. You've you've got all of those things in place, which is absolutely amazing because you've been with, you've been with us well. We've got the, all those things bashed out. But then it was kind of like actually, there's one thing I'm going to concentrate on now. <laughs> it was like ah, and it's like oh, hang on a second, there's some sales that we need to kind of do too and, uh, yeah, and buy that sure. yeah that's and the, so like, the, ah. ironic, the ironic thing is i'm a marketing person i mean i you know it's working in marketing in the 80s and 90s and all of that so personality wise i'm a sales and marketing person up to date on tech and social media marketing and email marketing and all of that steep learning curve i mean i know the whole um I think, I, yeah, I know the whole talk about the benefits and meet the customer's needs and all of that. But the tech, the learning of the tech, that's been one of the, the main strengths in the group is that, you know, the masterclasses or the, you know, just the, the call, the coaching calls, learning the details to, to get to the same place that I knew I wanted to get to, but hadn't got the knowledge, hadn't got the up to date knowledge. 
and my teenagers have now grown up, so I can't be patronised at home just as quickly as I used to be able to be. Um, so, yeah, just having that uh, that encouragement and just the practical help to try and get to that point. Um, but yes, you're right. I focus too much on my skills and production and uh, textiles and you know just product design. I can go down a big rabbit hole because um, I'm quite big. No, um, and you know, I get sucked into that. And also I've got this a, a weird, I'm more scared of selling out than I am of not selling enough, which is really odd because that's where you lose money. But I'm not really fearful about losing money. It's just, it, you know, it seems to just happen. Um, but I'm quite fearful of running out, of doing well and not knowing how much further we could have gone. So I think there's something in that that I need to get over because I'm sort of holding back almost a little bit to try and make a small thing successful instead of thinking well we'll push it out and if we sell out never mind we've got everyone's interest and we'll put more in it next year so what are you um, aiming to do with those products do you want them left on the shelf at the end of the day or did you want them sold out I want it to be perfectly timed perfectly timed <laughs> 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 57 <laughs> last customer last item out that's you go it. that's the, the perfection would do at this point <laughs> But no, we do well in the January sale and that's fine and that's lovely. But um, yeah, I mean, like we've just had our normal, uh, one of our normal products is a hot wheat bag, a microwave wheat bag that you put around your neck and we make them in cashmere, recycled cashmere, which is, um, you know, especially spun, textile knowledge, blah, blah, blah. And they're absolutely beautiful and they sell really well. Just heard this morning, the knitting guy's got to put his prices up double and I just can't do it. So it's such a shame because that would sell. But if it's selling for no money, there's no point. So you're proud of me. I made an adult decision this morning that we didn't have to do them um, just to keep them in the range. You know, his prices are electric prices, staff prices. If he can't do it um, long term, I can find a different guy or I can design it differently. But we can't do it this year. So there you go. I'm gradually learning common sense instead of being run by my own daft ideas and vision. Too much vision, not enough accountancy, basically, is my problem. I think you, you, we all do need that accountant alongside us at times just to say, yes, you can you can have, you know, get that balance right between selling out and selling out. Mm. And often you, the more you can give your target market what they want mm. and clear the shelves and sell out of what you sell, the less you have to sell out because you can put out a range that isn't going to make as much money. It still should be priced accordingly, but you can satisfy your artistic needs. Mm. Yeah. Once the bills have been paid. Once we've got some cash flow. Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And that is, it's, um, I'm trying to think of a famous example, but if you look at other likes of say Damien Hurst, you know, he can sell a very, very, very expensive print, but yeah. then, uh, sorry, a very expensive original paid for by selling millions of prints, which yeah. he doesn't want to make millions of prints. But that pays for the artistic, that pays the, bills. the yeah. lulls when he doesn't sell anything for six months because it's priced very, very high and it's very, very custom and very, very bespoke. Um, so it's, yeah, it's getting a balance right between giving the people what they want and giving the business owner what they want. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jason agreed with me yesterday that basically I can't have holidays because that's when I come up with brilliant ideas or so-called brilliant ideas. <laughs> and that's where I'm out of reach of you guys and um, my colleague that looks after me and makes me sit down sensibly. And so the answer is just not to have holidays. And uh, maybe when I make some money, I might be allowed to, you know, I don't know, design a postage stamp, but nothing bigger. No more big ideas. No more can, I, can I share my, my system with you for, for having ideas on holiday? Literally, I'm two days back from a holiday. Oh, yeah. So you have the ideas by the swimming pool with a cocktail in your hand. They're fantastic. They're the best idea in the world. Um, I, I, those who've listened to the podcast before will know I use a, um, an app called Brain Toss, which automatically emails you anything you send them. So screenshot, uh, MP3 recording, notes, everything like that. Email it to yourself and then send it back to yourself three months or six months in the future when you're not on holiday and you are in the day-to-day -day running of your business. And I've got stuff, I use an app called Boomerang in my email that just 
I don't want to look at that email now. Send it to me again in three months' time, six oh, months' yeah, time, whenever. Works. And these emails pop up three months later, and I go, no, <laughs> go away. <laughs> come come back in six months, and I might look at it again. And then six months later, yeah. it comes up, and I go, what a stupid idea that was. Let's let's forget that. <laughs> so yeah. it's that test of time. If it's a brilliant idea on holiday, you don't need to do it the minute you get back from holiday because you should already have your next 90 day plan already waiting for you which you should be sticking to the plan because you do stick to the plan don't you i have caught up actually i lost two months being quite poorly in the spring Mm. i have caught up we are going into september more organized than we've ever been so yes sort of i have a 90 day plan and i stick to it mostly that's as far as i'm going to go at this point (laughs) can i bring jason in on this but is is that true jace no, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's been at least three squirrels I've seen him chase him. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, no, I do, mostly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. That's, I mean, that's one of the things, because I think I'm fair to say that I, I see on the one-to-ones sporadically, and it's usually when... Is that is that a fair thing to say, sporadically? Yeah. Probably, isn't sporadically it? Is a good- not, not as routinely as we yeah. once used to. Well, I'm not so sure whether that's because you're scared of what I might say, or um, <laughs> you'd rather go the way that you'd like to go, <laughs> or um, <laughs> that is going to be. But uh, but that's that's great because everyone uses 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 me differently, which is which is fine. But um, needless to say, when we do see each other, it's it's a good old catch up that we have, and yeah. um, and I do tend to put you in the right, point you back on the the yeah, track. You do, you do. yeah. Not, yeah. not everybody wants to be on that path, but uh, I do force them back on <laughs> to get back on that path. It's normally their path, dictated by them. Yeah, <laughs> you chose the path. path. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, we're doing well. It was your idea to go back to doing the big Christmas fairs because we obviously stopped that during lockdown. And then the year after we thought, oh, we don't need those anymore. We've switched to an online business. And then Jason said at the start of the year, look, you're leaving money on the table, looked at the graphs from the previous year. And so, yeah, we followed that. We have booked... Um, even booked one more than we previously did and um, much more organised in our product range and our displays. So, yeah, so I feel as though Jason and I sort of planned the autumn back in January and we put the things in place and then we're just about, hopefully, got the products lined up and the everything else lined up, publicity lined up. So I feel as though that is the plan. Um, we'll just see how it works. I'll be texting you from Birmingham, <laughs> Jason, sold out or I haven't sold any or... Whichever way around it goes. Again, it's one of those lessons, isn't it? Is actually how did you do your sales before? Where have you got your customers before? Mm. And that always happened to be at, at the fairs and things. And you have that product which people need to handle, see, feel yeah. the quality, understand the vibrancy of the colours, and and do that via touch, really, and 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 see yeah. it, isn't it? And for you, that that's exactly where it is. But lot, again, lots of business owners don't necessarily re mm. trace over where customers have come from in the past with marketing campaigns and stuff that they may have mm. done in the past don't tend to go and do them again even though they were successful at the time before yeah. tend to look at them again because we've all oh, done that that's good that's that's a tick <laughs> i've done it but yeah. actually it's a really good place is when you're kind of hitting yourself somewhere and it's kind of like really stuck as an idea it's like well actually what have we done before what's worked for us in the past how has that come about and actually let's take that <laughs> and let's do yeah. it again a bit better maybe do it more efficiently maybe do it effectively or whatever but let's do it again and um it's, it's something again with with our one centers and other people that we speak to it's like well what have you done before this works let's just do that again we do that bit yeah so one we'll of the big things again. that i learned early on from the one percent club was email marketing i wouldn't have really thought of that i know this is two or three years ago now but um i think it was one master class or one um coaching call and I really, the penny just dropped. I just really got the hang of that one. And um, obviously it's relatively free or cheap to do. Um, and again, that has just been, I think 40% of our sales have come from that. So that's something we've carried on very much taking the the point of view that even if it's small, it's about the quality of relationships and, you know, 400 people come and spend 20 quid, then I'm very happy. Um doesn't have to be a list of 50,000 before you can make it work. But one thing I'm looking forward to at the craft fairs, or not Christmas fairs, I should call them, um, we always do really well with the mailing list building there. Um, give them a free piece of soap, you know, 18 piece soap in a frilly bag. And, um, you know, they go and call their friends, oh, Fiona, come here, she's got free soap. And um, <laughs> so easy. But when I started it, um, my colleague Sarah was sort of, oh, we can't ask people that. They'll all say no and be horrible to us. They don't. 
And it's amazing how many other stands, because you make friends with the stand holders while you're all standing there, standing on your stand, um, and none of them are doing it. And I'm sort of going, this, I've learned this in my club and it's brilliant. And, you know, even if you only get 10, that's 10 customers that might come back. I'm hoping to get a few thousand from these craft fairs this year. And then they're in the bag to be 40% of the turnover through that. And that was, I mean, all these things, I sort of think, right, I'm not going to be daunted. I'm going to do what you say, John, about just follow the instructions, just read the book, follow the instructions, listen to the course, follow the instructions. Very much did that with email marketing and it's built it up. Um, and even this, um, you know, saying we're still in the summer, there's nothing I can sell them. No one wants a hot water bottle. Um, but I'm just chatting to them behind the scenes. You know, isn't it crazy? We're doing Christmas photography or this is what I'm inventing. And even then, you know, nearly 50 percent are opening it and reading it. And that's just those figures have just come from perseverance, which is just amazing, isn't it? That you can yeah. just learn to do something like that and build up those relationships. But if you don't do that on the stands, people are feeling the products, having a nice chat and going away. That's just criminal. Never to be seen again. If they've touched them, then they see a photo online. You know, you've reinforced that instead of letting them disappear. So I I just, you know, that was one of the first things I learned in the 1% Club. And it's it's really stood us in good stead. It's been tremendous. Still to this day, um, it's one of the first things we tell new 1%ers. It's right. Are you sending an email to prospects and customers every single week? Uh, if not weekly, at least regularly, at least once a month. Um, we're going to be doing a coaching call directly after recording this um, about nurture assets from Evergreen Assets. Number one, I've got my notes over here. My number one note is one asset to rule them all, weekly emails. We bang this drum again and again and again. And so many people say, no, I, I don't need an email list. I'm, I've am i got Facebook. I've got a, an Instagram page. It's like, you don't own that. You don't control that. Um, and it, you mentioned just now, Caroline, it's, it's, it is a relationships, mm. a relationship building tool week by week. You slowly build a relationship with these people. Um, I was chatting with a guy yesterday and he said, I, I, I love this idea of weekly emails, but my business partner isn't on board. We've only got 234 people on our email list and Every time we gain some new ones, we lose some other people. And I went, look, don't worry about how many people you've got on that list. Because if you've got 234 people and you know every single thing about those 234 people, you know them by name. They know everything about you and they are absolutely within your target market. And you build a cemented relationship with those 234 people you've got enough people on that email list to to run a very successful business depending yeah. on your profit margins obviously we need the accountant in the room as well to make sure that your business model works but most people go i've only got 234 people i need 20,000 mm. on my list no you don't need 20,000 of the wrong people yes it would be nice to have more it'd be nice to grow the list but quality first and use it as a relationship tool, and that's that's what you're doing at the at the events. You're you're meeting people, you're having you're starting a conversation, mm. and then yeah. the email is, "Hey, do you want to keep this conversation going?" Yeah, and that's the other thing I think that a lot of people go wrong with email is not having a conversation, but rather broadcasting. Yeah, Here's the shit I've got to sell to you this week. Mm. <laughs> Do you want to buy the only question they ask is do you want to buy it <laughs> no our most successful ones are where we're sort of i call them the what am i like conversations the sort of oh, look what we've done or you know look how messy yeah. the studio is or you know what shall i choose i've got all these ideas or something colorful yeah. to show them but the other brilliant thing is that you can use your once it gets big enough you can use your mailing list in facebook ads to replicate that group and that character yeah um so and then you get more people like that through the Facebook ads. Um, so that's like a side benefit to the relationship thing. But people also often sort of say, well, I wouldn't know what to say. I haven't got anything to say, um, apart from thinking they don't need it and then thinking, what shall I say? And it's a bit like writing to your granny. You don't really want to write when the days when we wrote, you know, you, you didn't have anything to say. You couldn't tell her where you'd been out or who you'd been drinking with. So you had to just sort of stick to the basic. But <laughs> You know, it doesn't really matter as long as you're chatting as you. Um, 
yeah, I mean, people usually try and make me more main, mainstream. Um, and I don't think that works in this. I think you no. need to be yourself. You need to, you know, if I'm the bonkers creative, then that's what I am. There's no point. Um, anyway, you know, nobody responds to sort of say or speak anyway. But, you know, if I've had six mad ideas, let's just tell them that. And some of them come back and say yay or nay or at least I open it and read it. Maybe it's the humour. I don't know. Um, but, it's authentic, isn't it? That's, that's the thing. It's authenticity. And and you just have to be yourself. You have to be authentic because it's your character that shines through. It shines through when they meet you on the stand. It shines through when you drop them an email. It is about building that relationship. And I can't believe John didn't get his own quote in there. That seemed a bit ridiculous, really. But I'll try, I'll try and ruin it for him as well. <laughs> that's right. it's, a, it's that relationship game. It's not a numbers game, isn't it? Did I get it right? Did I get it right? Did I get it right? Yeah, just about, I think, you know. <laughs> but yeah that's it and uh so yeah being authentic and just being yourself is, is what everyone's endeared to um and therefore that's why you're getting 50 percent open rates that's why you're getting people to keep coming back and why you then go on and when you have got something to offer them they they'd like to take it from you and that's mm. that's how you get your 40 percent sales up so um mm. yeah. the hard thing with that though of course is um is delegating and growing um scaling because um I'm sure none of my dearest and dearest would want me to be claimed or <laughs> or extended in any way. But you can't delegate being an idiot um, and chatting, you know, enthusiastically about something or other or, you know, making daft jokes or daft quotes. You can't delegate that bit. So it's really hard. You can delegate. Uh, I mean, Sarah does all the social media now, but she has to develop her own voice. There was no point. Yeah. It, it flattened when she tried to copy something I would write. Um, and that is really hard. That's one of those things of switching between being a, an inventor, starter, entrepreneur and switching to trying to build it to scale. You can't you can't replicate yourself. So you have to interpret it and change. And that's I find that really hard. Um, some things I mean, I'm absolutely appalling at things, obviously, accounts. Uh, less obviously, but substantially navigation, um, any kind of admin delegating that I don't need to listen to a seminar telling me to work on my business not in it if it's accounts absolutely I don't want to be working in it that's not my bag but delegating product design or writing copy that expresses the brand yep. that is really hard it's much harder to let go of the things that you're fond of doing other things you know being a slave in a factory sewing absolutely delegate you know <laughs> decentralize don't need any convincing about that but it's really hard to you know if you're the innovator how do you i think we need to explore that how do you grow to scale and step back and have the lifestyle you want if you how do you pass on those skills or how do you let it free to develop i, I think there is a framework for it um i think ultimately it is ad adapting the brand voice mm. so that perhaps you would work with a copywriter who gets you Mm. get your style and actually the brand is then their style through you mm. so we used to um we used to have um a personality-led business where we weren't the personality we we employed the personality and the person with the personality changed we changed actual people mm. and as a result the new person that came into the road wasn't really a big mm. out there you know um you know well sort of well, well loved well spoken um big personality so we got this person to sit down with our copywriter and just talk to him for about an hour and a half on a zoom call they recorded yeah. the zoom call the copywriter then went away and told this guy's stories in our brand voice okay and that worked. And if that was the permanent brand, the permanent voice, the permanent message, people wouldn't notice a disconnect because it would always be that voice. Um, it's never the only way it's going to be truly authentic, 100% you is for you to do it yourself. Mm. Um, but it can be 80% authentic you, whereby you put your voice and your core values and your ethos through someone who gets you. And who is also a little bit bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't remember the last time we used the word bonkers on, on this podcast. Have we ever? Maybe. <laughs> you might have been talking about me at some point, I should have thought. 
I imagine um, so. <laughs> but again, thinking about scale, if your if your primary um, route to market is email marketing, well, your route to scale is just getting a, a bigger list of the right yeah. people, and that is I can't emphasize that enough. If you've got your people who get you and they get your humor and they love your products, a you're never going to sell out because you're going to give your people what they want and what they want is also what you want and scaling up is just you're still writing the same number of emails you're just sending them to more people yeah yeah emails is a good one yeah um and the same with christmas fairs i mean you know there's only one of you on one stand and the amount of people that come past aren't up to you but what's up to you is how well you engage them and how well you follow up um and again that's the same for everyone it can be replicated um just going to switch this year to doing our email sign up online as we as we're there which would be another it's the tech things that that novel me we've been collecting email addresses on paper and having to get a typist friend to put them in and now we're going to do it with a tablet which is you know just before the world changes and we all just beam it up through our eyeballs or something um so things like that but again it comes back to relationship and then choosing what you can scale i mean i'm still doing all our graphic design because i love doing it and i'm quite good at it but that's got to go that can be that could be delegated that's not a voice i mean it is a voice but it's a voice that can be expressed in um you know standards and rules of fonts and things so yeah I mean, the other thing is i i was thinking and, and as a kind of bring this down a little bit i suppose and that is if you really enjoy it and it's the passion of yours why would you want to give it up hmm if that's, what you doing, if that's your purpose in life if it, not, not purpose in life that's not the right way of putting it but if that's your purpose if you like if that's what you really enjoy that's what you're passionate about why would you want to hand that over let's get rid of the shoddy stuff that you hate yeah. let's get rid of those accounts let's get rid of the admin yeah. let's get rid of the standing on the stand maybe even but mm. let's let's keep the bit that you really enjoy because that's mm. the reason why you've got your business and that's the bit you really enjoy and, and that goes out for most biz, you know business owners and stuff and i appreciate the scalability and all of that kind of stuff but we've already talked about it's just a number and and it's it's more emails and it's blah 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 blah, blah. that bit yeah. it doesn't change does it but if you really enjoy writing and you or you really enjoy mm. doing a week and i would argue keeping that would be something mm. that you'd want to do not only for yourself well, the emails yeah I really yeah. love it. <laughs> yeah. But I also come back from holiday with three other companies I want to start and or buy. So you're not going to see those for another six months. It's fine. Something has to give. <laughs> it's a sort of curve, oh, the yeah. entrepreneur's curse, isn't it? But I could be doing this. Yeah. Uh, we, we've talked about this many times uh, when we were running sort of very much website based businesses. Um, we would have ideas and we'd go and register the, the domain name. Yeah, we reminder two years later of our ideas when it was time to renew those domain names, which two years earlier were million pound ideas, and yeah. two years later I'm not paying seven pound to renew them. <laughs> yeah, it's not a great success. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, this is where being accountable comes in because uh, sometimes I tell Sarah my bonkers ideas, and I haven't yet been brave enough to tell Jason my bonkers ideas. But knowing that you've got to pass it through people who care about you but might have a clearer perspective is a brilliant thing. Mm. Um, otherwise, you you know you just find me on a Scottish hillside howling and you know sending emails to everybody with my ideas. I wouldn't be any good to anyone. So, um, yeah being in a team with different people is definitely a healthy thing if you're an ideas person um so meanwhile jason uh, wants to buy something in yorkshire (laughs) you've got our could do list to put all those ideas on that's that's the good thing yes yeah it's a balance because i mean fairly short-term future i'd like to have an industrial unit and get everything consolidated and well organized but we can't do that without cash flow and industrial units in plymouth that are a totally different price to industrial units in north london um or pretty much anywhere else in the country so again just write it down keep the vision but you know we'd have to be earning so much cash to be able to save money on all the systems there will hopefully be that point but as you say write it on the long list don't mention it too often to sarah and (laughs) she doesn't know that i'm scrolling right move looking at commercial properties (laughs) But you can look at it every 90 days. It's like comes back to your top of your, t- your could-do list. It's like, actually, yeah. is it there? 
have are we have do we have the resource to be able to do this one this quarter we have the resource to be able to you know what do we need to do to get that resource okay we need to do more of that this quarter so that next quarter we can it may float to the top then it may not it may be another quarter of having to do more to get more resource but actually that's how you're going to look at that and you can reassess it all the time and that stops you looking at right moves because actually this quarter it's not about right move it's about selling more stuff <laughs> and i'm not going to do that by looking at right move yeah this is and true. Then knowing, knowing the bits that you are working on because the opportunities on right move are always going to be there may not be the same place but they'll always have those opportunities but when it's right for you to do that that's the time to start looking isn't it yes jason I want to see. Have you got right move open at the moment on your, on another screen? No, 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 no. But I have I have just been doing a lot of sewing to do some odds and ends for the Christmas shows to use up bits, and uh, so I listened to your um, coaching calls and your um, masterclasses, and one of them recent one about the recession and how to survive it and all of that and the uh, opportunities that you could take hold of in the middle of a recession. like cheap commercial property, like cheap yes. Commercial property. <laughs> it's all right, Jason. I won't do it without asking. <laughs> but I find it so hard not to get lost in a dream world of vision and to focus on day-to-day -day tasks. Because once I've thought about them, they've been in my head on board. Mm. I don't want to sit and do them, which is a handicap. Um, and also, apparently, I have no sensitivity at all to risk. Um, so I just don't know. Which would be why we worked in Cambodia with a one-year-old and uh, you know mm. hiding under the table in a military coup. That was. <laughs> <laughs> risking financially for a desk doesn't feel risky to me so that's interesting actually because what you know our past does does frame us doesn't it and, and when you sent over the bio about what you're what you've been up to that really stood out and it's kind of can you just chat about that because as i say it frames us for future life and as i said you say you're not risk <laughs> you know you're you're, risk you don't, it's nothing <laughs> not when you've got bombs going off around you so yeah, yeah. Let's, let's just put that a little bit in my mind uh Something we had in common when David and I were going out, which was, you know, hundreds of years ago, 1980, um, yeah, we were very involved in the church at the time. We were, you know, great believers that we could, you know, bring about world peace if we all just got stuck in, you know, the sort of thing when you're younger, plus the love of travel. Um, didn't want to settle down. We both, even now, both get bored really quickly. Um, yeah, so we decided, well, the Hong Kong thing was a, something of a cul-de-sac we we joined this agency that wanted people in Cambodia but wanted us to go to Hong Kong to the head office for three weeks orientation and then three weeks so they didn't have much for us to do it three weeks you're meant to just get to know people and fit the team and then we started doing work and then they wanted to just keep us and we ended up staying there two years and not getting to Cambodia at all um so we joined a different agency to go to Cambodia, but I'd been I'd had a baby by then. And my parents were aghast that we would take a one year old to go and work in a third world country. Um, and she she loved it. I mean, she's still really, really great traveler and everything. Um, yeah. So we wanted to go make a difference, really. David grew up in Thailand. His parents were medical missionaries. So he grew up in Thailand and boarding school in Malaysia. So it was in his in his blood to go back to that climate and those smells and that food. and. Um, I loved it as well, although I have to say it was misleading because I succeeded really well in Hong Kong and everyone was going, oh, you've adapted to travel and culture and aren't you doing, you know, aren't you flexible? It's a city, English speaking, all the roadsides are really, <laughs> it's like the same as living in London with on tap Chinese food everywhere. <laughs> so it's like, weirdly, I successfully adapted to that. Um, Cambodia was a different thing and it wasn't the people and the climate or the standard on you know different facilities for living um I, it was the americans that got me i just um uh, it was really strange i i just uh it was all floral dresses and baking and not my world at all i just left management world in england where everyone you know my age group of women we were trying to break through i mean now they've you know they moan if anyone pats their bottom but at the time we were trying to break through a you know, trying to get to management and trying to work. So we were quite feisty working women at home. And so I left my friends there and got here. And it was like, oh, no, you can, you you know, you can make muffins and stay at home and uh, you've got a baby. And I was like, well, I have got a baby, but I've also got a helper in the house and a man in the garden. And um, that was hard. You're meant to employ people. You go thinking, oh, we won't employ people. We'll live at a local level and fit in. 
but actually you're doing them all a favour if you employ a lot of people, um, get some money in the economy, get them learning English, blah, blah, blah. So that you had to have that. So I didn't need to be at home 24-7 with a one-year-old that sleeps a lot. Um, so, yeah, brief hiatus of trying to make muffins. These women, they wouldn't even share their muffin recipes. It was like, oh, no, that's a family recipe. So I thought I'd play this for a game of soldiers. So I'm on the you know early days internet, downloaded six or seven muffin recipes, perfected those flipping muffins, and then took them to the club. And everyone went, oh, these are lovely. What's the recipe? Oh, I cannot tell you. Um, but anyway, after about six months of floral dresses and muffins, I decided, play this, so I'm going to start my own business like you do so i uh, did a variety of things there were several e-commerce type charities trying to sell ethnic stuff at home so i did a bit for them and then this false leg thing took off that they needed a graphic designer um it, you don't even need to be a doctor it's more of a um it's more of a sort of engineering sort of thing to fit false legs so um yeah, so lots of graphic design and technical drawing. But I was just like, I can't sit at home and do nothing. I've given up a good career. I don't need to make muffins. Once well, you've had a muffin, you've had a muffin. Um, sorry, Baker's listening. Uh, so, yeah, so I struck, struck again. Um, largest failure at that point that David still refers to. I decided to start my own charity called um, The Tin Cat, which is an anagram of ethnic tat. And I was going to sell a lot of fair trade stuff back in England so this is the this is the road to entrepreneurship paid with disasters so I got a load of stuff from different charities that I'd done the buying for that we knew were there shipped them all back to a gullible friend of mine in Leicester who was going to try and sell them but not knowing that in the 90s the fair trade here because I wasn't here had taken off and every ox firm and everybody was doing earrings and coconut bowls and so I shipped a whole load of stuff here, which we then later had to just sell to a wholesaler because it was just went flat. So David feels as though he gave a huge amount of money to charity <laughs> that he wasn't really expecting to do. Um, Cambodia wasn't that dangerous. There was a military coup the first few weeks we got there. Um, sounds dangerous. We were hiding under the kitchen table with a baby. Um, our baby. Um yeah, they were fighting amongst themselves. The people that got hurt were people like the Japanese. What you want to do in the case of a coup, which we're all trained to do, was have enough food in the house and stay in your house. What the Japanese did was rush to the airport, um, panicking, oh, we've got to get out, we've got to get home. And the airport's one of those key places that factions always fight for, like controlling the media, controlling the airport. You know, there's, if you didn't go to the airport, which was no reason to, then it was... It really wasn't that dangerous. They weren't fighting Westerners who'd come to help and were bringing foreign dollars. So it sounds dodgy, but it wasn't, um, you know, it was fun. That's cool. So I just, I just want to grab, so we've obviously heard about risk as being one of those things, actually, it, it doesn't matter. The risk isn't important to you right now. What's a positive? I don't, I don't see that as a positive, by the way. And what's a positive? <laughs> <laughs> what's a positive you can take from your time away uh, overseas, I guess? What's a positive thing that you've now applied to your business or you would say, positively affect your business i think it was the freedom i mean certainly in the 80s and 90s when i was working here things were very very rigid and the men that were in management were in their 50s in 1980 so they were quite older older generation of thinking it's the freedom when you're somewhere like cambodia it's so desperately poor any initiative to help them make money or foster a craft or a farming fish or sewing or whatever you can get them to do to help them start their little economy going um anyone anything went i mean we went through quite strict psychological profiling and testing to see if we wouldn't crack and working abroad in those conditions and you know we scraped through that with all sorts of fairly dreadful process um and then you get there and every Tom, Dick and Harry has come under their own steam with no checking and is having barging around, never mind cultural sensitivity, forget that. Um, and it was the freedom. It was the freedom to think, I can think of an idea and I can make this work, which if I'd stayed in management in Britain, women at that point, it was quite constrained. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was. But anyway, um, so I would say it's the freedom. I've always had the initiative, but before I'd have had ideas and then I'd have gone oh but that won't work and there's no way I could do it and you know 
I've got to wait. I think I've spent a lot of my life thinking I've got to wait for someone else to pick me and promote me and choose me to do something. And that was the turning point of thinking, well, I'm on my own here. I'm not going to sit in a house making muffins. Uh, you know, I've given up my job and my house and my close family. I want to do something. And it was that freedom, really, I would say, the freedom to to have a crack at something. If I mean, I don't advocate having a unstructured society with no laws but it was liberating um yeah when you came back and also liberating talking to people um I'm a Londoner we don't talk to people on the tubes um you know that's you just don't do that that's not done but you live in a foreign country for three years trying to learn the language and I can speak a bit um better than David um you're trying to communicate and, you know, we were trying to communicate in some cases about quite important things about, you know, hygiene or malarial nets or, you know, um, or just chatting to them when you want to go shopping and practice your language. And then you come home and everyone speaks the same language. And I couldn't stop talking to people. I mean, I was, I was salesy already, but I'll talk to anybody now, as you can discover. Um, and it was really liberating because here we're all in our little, you know, don't talk on the tube, don't talk unless you've been introduced, you know. You could meet someone at a party, but you're waiting to be told, oh, they're a friend of so-and-so before you talk to them. And now, uh, you know, you can't stop me. So <laughs> I've go. got two questions there for you. What's Cambodian for muffin? <laughs> oh, uh, paim, I would say. That just means sweet or pudding. Paim. Paim. Okay, um, cool. And we ask everybody on, uh, on our podcast, because this is the Ambitious Lifestyle Business podcast, what does ambitious lifestyle business mean for you? Uh, most days of the year, I would say reading a book in the garden. Some days of the year, just sitting in the garden. Um, I've, I've narrowed it down since I've had children, just not needing, not being needed would be good. No, I'm starting, as <laughs> I'm glad to hear, I've got more vision, starting to think if I can make some proper money, I would like to get a bit more philanthropic. So I like that. Oh, there's billions of charities, aren't there? But I like that one that's giving kids breakfast before school, things like that. I'd like to have billions of pounds to be able to choose where it went to make a difference. Um, I don't know if that's ever going to be possible or whether I just pay back what I owe the household and, and lie in the garden. <laughs> that's probably more achievable. But I would. I'd like to have enough longer to be able to really make a difference um, mm -hmm. in some way. Oh, lovely. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe, maybe a cottage in Cornwall as well where I can ignore the world and just read in my garden. <laughs> <laughs> if you do, it's down by the lizard because there's very mo very little mobile oh. down there, as I found out a couple of weeks ago. So yeah, yeah if you want to go down the lizard, yeah. beautiful to look at. Five minutes from the beach, walk and yeah, uh, yeah. Beach. Beach. have a look on right move. Yes, yeah. <laughs> 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 <What a commercial. laughs> the other side, Caroline, it's been amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you, Caroline. See you again soon. Bye. So there we are, another episode in the can. Um, how was it for you? Please let us know. Um, how do you listen to these podcasts? Um, please leave a review on that platform. Let us know what we can do better, what you like, what you don't like, and how we can improve to make this show even better for you. We'll see you next time.